to see so many here. Praise the Lord. Hi, David. Um, we have read a very important passage in Scripture. And I just want to make the connection with what we had before. The theme that we are studying is how to grow spiritually. Now, before I go on, I just want to read a verse in John 3. In John 3, where John the Baptist was speaking about his experiences with the Lord Jesus. John 3, in verse 30. John 3, verse 30. He says, He, he, and that's the Lord Jesus, He must increase, but I must decrease. This was the greatest prophet. The Lord Jesus called this man the greatest prophet. The greatest prophet said this. So, if that was needed for him to say, he, and that's the Lord Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's also true for us. That also applies to us. And in order to grow, that's our theme, spiritual growth, we've seen in First Peter 2, like a baby needs the milk of the mother to grow. Well, in order to grow for us spiritually, we need to decrease. We need to become smaller so that the Lord Jesus becomes bigger in our lives. So, in order to grow spiritually, I must become smaller. Like John says, I must decrease. But he must increase. That's a must. That's so important. You have three must in this chapter in John 3. You must be born again. Everybody already born again here? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. But then there is a second must, you know, in the same chapter. The Son of Man must be lifted up. Without his sacrifice, no salvation. Without his work, we could not be saved. We could not become a child of God. We could not increase. We could not grow. So the third must is, he must increase. Okay? That's a must. There's no other way. And I must decrease so that he can become greater. Now let's go back to Romans 8. Romans 8 is part of a whole a treatise, a whole overview that Paul gives, a doctrinal overview. How people are lost in sin, Romans 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then how through faith you can be saved and then also develop a relationship with the Savior God. The Savior God is my Father. The Savior God is the Lord Jesus. That's a mystery how the Trinity, the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit is involved in this. But it is a, it's a truth. It's a mystery, but at the same time a truth. And so in Romans, we find this development, how the doctrinal aspect is shown, how this is God's doctrine, that man is corrupt, man has sinned, but he can be saved, he can be brought back to God, because the work of the Lord Jesus that he accomplished, there's a way back to God. But that takes faith. Faith that God gives, but the faith, I have to put my trust in him. I have to learn to take this low place, not seek a high place for myself. And so in Romans 5, you see how Paul could say, that's like uh, triumph, call and triumph. Therefore, having been justified on the principle of faith. That means God has declared me right. The God who is right has declared me right on the principle of faith, through faith. And then we have something in common. We have. It would be interesting to study in Scripture the, all the we have. Here's one. We have peace with God. That means there is now a relationship of peace towards God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2 says, by whom we have, that's another we have, access. So God allows us to enter his presence 
by faith. And he put us there in his favor in which we stand. That's God's grace. That is undeserved favor. And Paul says, we boast in hope. Why is there hope? We have not reached the glory yet. He boasts in the hope of the glory of God. And so then in Romans 5, he explains how we are all descendants of Adam and how we are lost in our sins. And then God has transferred us from the old Adam, we are all descendants of the old Adam, to a new Adam. The Lord Jesus became the head of a family. You find it in Romans 5, verse 12 to 21. That's a very complicated passage, but it shows that God has transferred us from the old head to a new head. And now we are under a new rule, under a new leader, the Lord Jesus. And we are under a new reign. Righteousness reigns now. And then in chapter 6, he works that out, how this can happen in our lives, through faith, through um, a work of the Holy Spirit. And now we need to yield ourselves. Uh, chapter 6, verse 13, yield yourselves to God as a life from among the dead. So we have this commitment. We need to reckon ourselves in ourselves, dead to sin, verse 11. That means, I have no strength in myself. I cannot improve myself. It's a hopeless situation. God has crucified this old man. I cannot expect anything good from that old man. And so I know that now Christ has been raised up, verse 9. And because of that, I reckon myself dead to sin and alive to God, in verse 11. And that is why he says in verse 13, Yield yourselves to God as alive. So that is the, I present myself, I present my members, I present my body, we present together, we present ourselves to God as alive from among the dead. We belong to a new order of things. We are not belonging to this world of death anymore. We have been taken from this world and belong to a new order of things, a new family, where Christ is the head. And now our members need to be instrument of righteousness for God's glory. In chapter 7, he shows that I cannot do that in my own strength. The new nature shows what God's desires are, but I still the old nature in me. That's the battle in Romans 7, and that ends with this cry out, crying out, wretched man that I am. There's no hope for the old man. There's no hope for the flesh. You cannot improve the flesh. It's impossible. And so that's a battle... And the end of the battle is, in the end of chapter 7, where he says, O wretched man, 7.24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me out of this body of death? Verse 25, I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, the situation is, I'm still here with the flesh in me, I serve the flesh, I'm, but at the same time, I serve God's law. So that's God's law. There are seven different meanings for the word law here in this passage, but I don't go into that now. But God's law, we are now subject to God's mind, to God's law, to God's uh, commands. That's not the law of Moses, that is a new law, the law of Christ. And so... Because of that, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if we have put our faith in the Lord Jesus, we have come to know Him as our Savior, then we are in Christ Jesus. You know, it's interesting, in all Paul's writing together, you have 49 times in Christ Jesus. That's a new relationship. We were in Adam, the first man, but now God has transferred us to be under a new leader, a new head, and now we are in Christ Jesus. Messiah, Christ, Messiah, the anointed one, is now in heaven. Jesus, the humble man of Nazareth, he is now in heaven. And we are in Christ Jesus. So when God looks at you, he sees us in Christ Jesus. And Romans 8 speaks about this wonderful truth that we are now under a new leader, the Lord Jesus, that we are under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, not under the flesh or our own efforts. 
so that the Holy Spirit may take over. And in that context, we have read Romans 8, 28. We're still in this world. Everything is in chaos. Everything is in turmoil. But what does this verse say, 28? But we know. So we have, and many others, we have, but we also, we know. What do we know? That all things work together. God makes all things work together. He makes all things cooperate. Whatever happens, it is happening for the good of those who love God. That's difficult to accept. That takes faith. To, to believe that everything works together for good. Brother Gideon had to have this surgery. It's just one example. Another one has an accident. Another one has this. Another one has that. There are so many things happening. But what this verse says, for the believer, for those who love God, all things, he makes all things work together for good. So it means... He is in total control. But I need to submit to his control. I need to see that he is still in control in this world that is out of control. And what is it saying for those who love God? This is true that the believer can see that all things work together for good. Sometimes you don't see it right away. Sometimes you, much later you understand, oh, this happened because God had this in mind. God is in control. And it is connected with those who are called according to purpose. That's a difficult word. Purpose is plan. It's also sometimes translated as counsel, God's counsel. Now what was God's counsel? That's what you have in verse 29. God's plan. What was God's plan for our lives? He foreknew us. So before the foundation of the world, he knew us already. And then he made a plan. He has us predestined. That is God's plan. Not to go to hell. He predestined us, the believers of this day who are in Christ Jesus, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. And that's not the point today, this conformed I want to talk about a bit more. God has a plan that we, the believers, who were foreknown before the foundation of the world, who were predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's why John said, he must increase, I must decrease. God wants to form Christ in us. That is God's concept, that the image of his son would be formed in us and we will be conformed. This word conform means a, a morphe, that means form, according to his form. God wants to change us, to reform us, as it were, so that we are conformed, the same form as his beloved son, so that he will be the firstborn. That's the result or that's the objective that his son, God's son, the son of his love, the Lord Jesus, that his son would be the firstborn. And the word firstborn, we have eight times in the New Testament. Eight uh, represents a new order of things. The Lord Jesus was born of Mary. He was her firstborn. That's the first time in Luke 2 that you find this word. Firstborn also implies the first of many others to follow. The Lord Jesus is the firstborn. So, of among many brethren, he is the firstborn of a family of many brethren. And just to take away some confusion, that implies all the sisters, okay? This word brethren implies brothers and sisters. And it is a company that is marked by the word many God had in mind an abundance of brothers and sisters who called here brethren of his son. That he would be the firstborn among them. He would be the firstborn among them. The Lord Jesus is also the only begotten of the Father. That's a different, different term. He is the unique son of the Father. From eternity 
He is the Son. We're not talking about that now. That is between the Father and the Son. We never enter the Godhead. Some people believe that when you become a believer, you become like little gods. That's the wrong concept. That's, that is really New Age or paganism. What God has in mind is that the Lord Jesus, the Son of His love, that He would, that he, we would be conformed to His image so that we would be more like Him. So don't confuse that with the unique Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. is the same person, but He is the Son, the, the first uh, born of many others to follow. Find the firstborn in connection with creation, Colossians 1. He's the firstborn also in connection with resurrection. He's the firstborn in the, new, in the world to come. He's always the firstborn. He's always this rank of honor and uh, authority that is connected with him. But we, we are seen here as connected with him. We are seen as the linked to the firstborn among many brethren. So... This is God's concept. And that's explained in verse 30, but whom he has predestinated is also called. So in time, God called us. He had a plan from before the foundation of the world, but in time, for some it is maybe 50 years ago, for some it is yesterday or the day before, that you were called. That is God's calling in time. Okay. So God's plan goes back from before the foundation of the world. But in time, he has called us through a friend or through the radio program or whatever it is. God has called us. Is that true? Yes. Everyone has been called. And this is a call that cannot be um, go unanswered. This call is so powerful, you have to respond to that call. It implies a work of God. When God calls... For example, when he called Abram, God worked in Abram at the same time so that he responded to that call. Another example, Saul of Tarsus. We've read the last time in, when we were in Galatians. I want to refer to Galatians later also in a moment. But Galatians 1, we have seen that when God called Saul of Tarsus, at the same time there was a work in him. Galatians 1, verse 15. So when the time had come that God, who had set me apart from my mother's womb, called me. So there was a time that God called Saul of Tarsus. Saul! Saul! That was a powerful call. And God was at work at the same time because he, Galatians 1 says, it, was, it pleased God to reveal his son in me, so there was a work of God going on. God, the Lord Jesus from heaven, called Saul of Tarsus. He says, who are you, Lord? At the same time, a work of God started in him. He started to respond to that call. I read a story the other day. Um, I was reminded of that. There was a man, years back in India, in the army, at the time that the UK uh, possessed India. And there were um, missionaries working there. And one missionary had uh, the idea to visit those officers. And he would use them at time that they would be ha having their siesta, like between 2 and 3 or so, or, or 1 and 3, whatever. So this evangelist knocked on the door of this officer. And he said, come in. And he read Genesis 1, verse 2 where we just read these important words. The earth was waste and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. He closed his Bible, turned around, and was gone. How oh, crazy fellow is that? The next day, the same time, he came back. He read the same scriptures. My, what guy is this? I mean, I don't know what this officer thought. But then you know what happened? The third day, the third day, this evangelist came in again, and he looked at him, and he read the same verse, and then he looked at him again. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. At that moment, the Spirit of God worked in that man so that he got saved. He got born again. 
it's a mystery. Now that was my point now. That happened to Saul of Tarsus when the Lord called him from heaven in this light that superseded the light of the sun at noon. God was at work in this call. And that is why we read it, God was pleased to reveal his son in me, Paul says in Galatians 1.16. Now I want to apply that to all of us. God, when he called us, he started to work. And his work is that he wants to make us conform to the image of his son. So he started to reveal his son also in us. And he has a plan for each one. We saw that the last time in Galatians. And so when God calls, he begins a work in us. And to go back now to Romans 8, that implies then that he is making us conform to the image of his son. That's a process. That is a transformation. See the for word form is in it? Like the little caterpillar becomes a pupa, and then all of a sudden on a sunny day, out of the pupa comes a little butterfly. It's amazing. It's a tremendous miracle. And then the butterfly starts to fly after a while, and then the beautiful sunlight is reflected by his wings. It's an amazing sight. And that is what God is working in us so that we can reflect something of the beauties of the Lord Jesus. That's what God has in mind. So he wants us to make us conform to the image of his son. And that's going on now at the moment he, from the moment that he called us until the rapture. Perhaps today. We need to be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus. But in the meantime, he is transforming us. Let's go to Philippians. I want to come back to Galatians one more time later. But in Philippians, we find, I mentioned earlier that Saul of Tarsus was called. And in Philippians, you see how Paul or Saul at the time describes his situation. Uh, he says in Philippians 3, in verse 4, Though I have my trust even in flesh. So he put his trust in the flesh. There's many reason to put in the trust in the flesh. But you saw in Romans 7, you cannot put your trust in the flesh. But from a human perspective, he had much reason to put trust in the flesh. But he learned that it doesn't work. And so he learned to see what God's concept was so that he would be found blameless, not on the basis of his own efforts, but Philippians 3, verse 6, he says, As to righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I counted on account of Christ's loss. Verse 8, But surely I count also all things to be lost on account of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, on account of whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but filth, that I may gain Christ. In order that I may gain Christ. So, Paul had this desire to be able to grow, to gain Christ. And in the concept what we saw earlier, that implies God's work to make him conformed to the image of his son. And he continues to say in verse 9, that I may be found in him, in Christ, in the Messiah, not having my righteousness, he was blameless according to what he said earlier, but in connection with that beautiful image that he saw in Christ, that his own righteousness had no longer any value. And it says in verse 9, that is based on the principle of law, but then that which is by faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God through faith. So God transformed Paul so that he was now really in tune with God and God's rights, not on the basis of his own efforts, but because of a work of God in him. And then he goes on to say, to know him in verse 10 and the power of his resurrection. So what was Paul's desire? I want to know him better. I want to know more. 
I want to know who he is, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. So Paul was saying, if I can know him better, even if that goes through sufferings and trials, I go for that. The result is being conformed to his death. So that goes very low. Saul was ready, Paul as a believer was ready to be conformed to his death. They have the same word. In order to be conformed to his image, he was ready to suffer. And then in verse 11 he says, If any way I arrive at the resurrection from among the dead. He was looking forward to that. He says in verse 12, Not that I have already obtained the prize, or am already perfected, but I pursue. He was running after it. <coughs> and so in verse 13 he says, Brethren, I do not count to have got possession myself, but one thing I do, forgetting the things behind and stretching out to the things before, I pursue. He was running a race. What was the goal? The price of the calling on high of God in Christ Jesus. So, positionally, he realized, I am in Christ Jesus. But Paul's, Paul's desire was to become, practically, what he was in Christ. So, let me say it this way. God wants us to be what we are. We are in Christ Jesus. So, in Christ Jesus, we are perfect. But now God says, I want you to be what you are. I want you to be practically what you are in Christ Jesus. So that means I want to see Christ and not, nothing else. That's what God's uh, desire is. And that's why we have this topic of spiritual growth. That Christ may become greater. That he may increase and I must decrease. That was John's experience and so that is what Paul experienced. And that is what we saw the last time in Galatians and after that we go back to Romans 8. In Galatians 4, the last time, we saw that Paul was speaking to those who had come to know the Savior through his ministry. When Saul, Paul and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14, many people from present-day Turkey came to know the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. And then they were exposed to uh, people who tried to insinuate that Paul's teaching was not good enough. They also had to do other things. And so there was a tremendous battle afterwards. And Paul says in Galatians 4, we had that the last time, where he says in verse 19, my children. Why did he say my children? He was speaking to believers. But they had been unbelievers and they had accepted the gospel, and that is why Paul, and that was through Paul, so they became spiritually his children, my children. And then he says in Galatians 4.19, of whom I again travail in birth. So he had been working hard so that they could be saved. And now there was a problem. They needed to grow, but there were hindrances. There were all kind of efforts of the enemy to stop them from growing. And so now Paul says, you know, I am in travail again. I'm in burst pain so that Christ may be formed. See, that's the same root form, morphe, that's the same, the same idea that Christ may be formed in you. And so Christ formed in us implies then also that we will be conformed according to his image. So this was... Paul's desire that the believers there would be ready that Christ might be formed in them. Are we ready that Christ may be formed in us? God uses all kinds of things, and that's what we saw in Romans 8. God's in control. He can use an accident. He can use a sickness. He can use whatever it is to bring us closer to himself. Romans 8, 28 shows that God's in total control. And he's a God of love. That we should never forget. God is light. We had in Genesis 1. God is light. But also God is love. And he has a plan to conform us to the image of his son. That's his work. And 
just to connect it to a few other scriptures we have seen in the in the past. In First Peter two, the baby needs to grow. But then Peter says, you know, I want you all to have this desire, even if you are older as a believer, you have grown already. Peter says, I want you to have that desire, the sincere work, uh, milk of the word, so that you can continue to grow. If you fall into a routine and the word of God becomes not very interesting anymore, Peter says, as it were, I want the word of God to become precious to you so that you grow further. And in 2 Peter 3, he says to all the believers, there are many dangers, many false teachings. But he says, you know, what I want, I want you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Peter said that shortly before he passed away. And he said, you know, I want you to grow. I don't want you to start uh, rely on what people can offer. He, he wants the believers, every believer to grow so that you become independent of man and more dependent on the Lord in the glory. That's what, what God wants. So he used Peter to uh, explain that to the believers. And we have seen other scriptures, uh, other occasions, Romans 12. I just want to connect that with what we have here in Romans 8. In Romans 12 at one time, we talked about that. But, but Paul says, I urge you, I beseech you, by the compassion of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. So, as I said earlier, God wants us to be what we are. That means total commitment, total surrender. And it implies the body. It's not only a matter of the spirit or of your heart. It's also a matter of your body that is set aside now to become a living sacrifice. Holy, set apart for God, acceptable. That means that God is pleasing to accept it. And that is your intelligent service. That's something that God reasonably can expect from us, that we would set ourselves apart for him, to make ourselves available to him. And in that context, he says in verse 2, and be not conformed. They have the same word again. Not conformed to this world, but conformed to the image of his son. And that implies that there is this transformation formation. We saw in Philippians something that happened to Paul when he was saved. And then he wanted to know more. And at the end of Philippians 3, I wanted to mention that also, he mentioned there will be a moment that also our bodies will be transformed. So sorry for that. I want to come back to Ephesians, uh, to uh, Romans 12 one more moment. But in Philippians 3 at the end he says, this transformation that he was looking for, that he would be morally transformed according to the image of the Son of God's love. He says, we await now, Philippians 3, 20, at the second part of verse 20, we await him from heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. So the Lord Jesus Christ, that is his full name, <coughs> We expect him as Savior. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I know him as my Savior already. But the point is here, the Lord Jesus is in heaven, and I'm still here on this earth. My body is still subject to decay and to sickness and all kinds of things. And so we expect him as Savior in view of this transformation of my body. But does it say in verse 21, who shall transform our body. So he's going to take my body, which is subject to decay because of sin. He is going to transform my body. So what we saw earlier, in the meantime, God is transforming us to make us conform to the image of his son. That's a moral transformation. But then finally, there will be also a transformation in connection with our body. And then our body will be in tune with his glorious body. Verse 21 says, he will transform our body of humiliation to conformity. It's not vile body, as the king says, it's a body of humiliation. And make it conform to his own body of glory. That's what the Lord's going to do. So he will transform my body that's subject to 
all kinds of things and make it conform to the body of his glory. And how he can do that? According to the working, the energy, the power that he has, that he can subdue all things to himself. He is going to reign over the whole universe. He can also conform my body to his own glorious body. That is a transformation. <clears throat> that is the end result of a transformation. But in the meantime, the Lord Jesus is working in a moral way to transform us already to his image. That's why I said earlier, he wants us to be what we are. In Christ Jesus we are perfect. But now he wants us to be practically what he has in mind. And that is to be conformed to him. So this is Romans 12. That is God's plan for us. That is connected with my reasonable service so that I will not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That is this moral transformation. You have the same also in 2 Corinthians 3. We looked at that on the other occasion. Paul says, we look up to him who is now in the glory. And the moment we look at him, we will be transformed. An example is with Stephen. Stephen, when he was hit by all those stones, they stoned him to death. He looked up to heaven, heaven was open to him, and he saw Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, at God's right hand. He was the most happy man on earth at that moment, while the stones were falling on him. He saw the Lord Jesus. And he, they have this moral transformation. And then he died, and he's still waiting that his body will be transformed also in resurrection. But my point is, he was transformed morally. He was not uh, angry because of the hatred of the Jewish leaders. He saw the Lord in the glory. And that's what we need to do. We need to look up to him who is in the glory. And then we are transformed, Romans 12, 2, by the renewing of our mind. And then we will also be able to test for the good and acceptable and perfect will is of God. So that, Romans 8, is that process that's taking place right now. On the one hand, everything is in turmoil, but God is in control. God has a plan, and his plan is to make us conform to the image of his Son. So, God's ways lead to the fulfillment of his plan. God takes his time. And when the Lord Jesus will come, we have just read that he will complete that work of transformation. We are saved. But then my body will be transformed also to be conformed to the image of his Son. But in the meantime, God is working through the Holy Spirit to have this moral transformation. And then finally, when the Lord will come, then we have also this physical transformation. And we'll be, our bodies will be transformed according to his glorious body. It's the same body, but totally transformed. In that sense, it is a new body. But it's the same body that God takes to make it new, to transform it. And how can God do that? Look, Romans 8, verse 30. Whom he has predestinated, so that's from before the foundation of the world. In time he called, and those he had called he has justified, that means declared right. If God declares me to be right with him, who can contest that? Romans 8. Uh, says it uh, in verse 33 it is God who justifies it's God who declares right who can condemn me so if God declares me right then I'm right in his eyes and so verse 30 goes on to say those who he has justified he has also glorified from God's perspective he sees us already in Christ. Where is Christ Jesus now? At God's right hand. He is glorified. He is in the heaven there. And God sees me in him. In that sense, he sees me already glorified. But in time, I'm not there yet. But in Christ, God sees me there. And that's why he can say, he say also glorified. It's amazing. And that is connected with verse 31. We'll close with this. I'll just read 31. What shall we then say to these things? It's a call in amazement. If God be for us, who is against us? Verse 32. He who has not spared his own son, <coughs> but delivered him up for us all, 
how shall he not also with him grant us all things? So God has a plan to make us conform to the image of his Son. Whatever can be brought in against us, verse 33, who shall bring in accusation against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ, the Messiah, who has died, but rather who has been raised up. We see him in resurrection. We see him now at God's right hand. What is he doing there? Who also intercedes for us. So think about that. The Lord Jesus, right there at God's right hand, is thinking of all the believers. He's praying. He's interceding for all of us. That's his ministry. He's there crowned with glory and honor. But he's very busy, if I use that term from a human perspective. He thinks of all the believers. And he cares for all the believers. Isn't that amazing? Now that is how important these verses are, that we see God's plan to make us conform to the image of His Son. We're not there yet, but the Lord is interceding. God's plan will be fulfilled. You can count on Him. You can put your trust in Him. You will not be ashamed. You will not be turned down by God, okay? And so may the Lord help us to really put our trust in Him and keep growing, keep growing, till He comes. Amen. Amen.